Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 173 for Monday, July 9th, 2018. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here, at least while we're recording this in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing today, Mr. Kent? I'm doing good, brother Dave. How you doing? I am good. I am good. As we mentioned in the last episode, we um, we would be recording this next one a little bit early with some travel that I've got going on, and uh, and I don't know. Have you had any gigs or anything since our our last recording, Paul? I played a good Fourth of July gig, oh, yeah. and it was the one I wrote. Yeah, I was talking about last time that it was a it was an interesting thing in that we took a non headline gig in our right. area, right? And um, you know, just real quick, the deal was uh, first we had to do some negotiation of set list stuff with the with the other band that was playing after with us, of course, and that went okay. Um, you know, nice guy and. Um, and we came to an agreement. It was cool. I mean, it was a bummer to have to do it in the first place, but it was sure. it was a reality. And then our set got caught cut short about five minutes early because the booker wanted to make sure there was enough time to to, to transfer over, which is just kind of grouchy. But I think I mentioned in the last show that you know this was a booking guy that I just couldn't seem to get on the same page with and understand why we don't do better or more with him. And um, he had an interesting conversation with Bill, our sound guy, before I even got there that Bill relayed to me. And then so I kind of let all of this stuff kind of, you know, go go right off my back and use it as an opportunity to um, use it as an opportunity to reengage with him. So I sent him an email today about the stuff that he was concerned about. And, you know, it, it is one of these things I want to kind of keep talking to you about it as we get more information, you know, yeah. about where we're going. Cause I think it's informative, you know, when you get that booking guy who's acting different than most booking guys in the area, clearly your story hasn't gotten through to him. And, uh, and how do you affect that is, is kind of, kind of what I want to do. So net net gig went pretty good. We played well. It was earlier in the day, high sun. So it wasn't as nearly as big a crowd as right before the fireworks show. We played well. Um, interestingly enough, they, the, the city of Santa Clara, where we played, uh, they taped the whole thing. Oh, no. Nice. They stream, yeah, they streamed the whole thing. So I, I put it on our Facebook page if anybody wants to check it out. Oh, I'll find the but, link and um, put it to it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah. So um, it was kind of cool. Cool. And uh, again, we, we I, I'd say it was about a B plus, you know, not as much time to sound check as we would have liked, but we got it done. And, and so it was, it was all right. How about you? Did you play since we talked last? No, I haven't. But I have a, my first public performance of Tommy is tonight. So it's time. It's time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But on, between now and then, something very exciting. Uh, this is a, this is somebody that I have known online for a while. Uh, introduced <laughs> to introduced to us by uh, our friend Dan East, our oh, mutual yeah. friend Dan East, uh, drummer, producer, full time working musician, Buddy Gibbons. Buddy, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Hey guys, thank you so much. And by the way, I want to thank you also for, you know, calling me to play drums on your theme song. That was really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you know, when, I, when we when when uh, when we first started playing that theme song, I thought I had played drums on that recording. And, <laughs> and then I found out that I had not. Um, it's a song by a, f a friend of ours and somebody that's been on the show, a guy named Mark Linsenmeyer. And uh, and I had done a bunch of recording with him when I was down in Austin. And I thought that was one of the tunes because it was one of the ones we played together. He's like, no, no, Steve Petrinko played drums on that. It's like, oh, wow. Oh, How about that? OK, I guess I learned Steve's part so well that I really thought it was me. <laughs> yeah, man. So um, this is, you know, you are you're like the most, ma most famous drummer that everybody's heard, but nobody knows uh, who you are. I, I think. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Dan, our, our mutual friend, Dan, in fact, calls me the invisible rock star. I like, and it. I think there's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I know it's, it's, it's an interesting space in which I live, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. I mean, because this is very interesting because you do music is your full-time thing in a variety of different ways and, and, and methods. <laughs> But, but like, how did that, how, like, I, I'm curious about all of it, but like, what's, what do you do? Let's, let's start there and then we'll figure out how you got here. So like, what's okay, a, what's a day, month, good. week in the life like for you? 
such thing as a as a normal day in quotation marks for me at all. Every day is quite different from the next. Um, and, and in fact, today, my day is about boxing things up to send out for a, a series of clinics that I'm doing next week and the week after. Uh, so, so that's what I'm going to be focused on all day today. And that's my job. That's just kind of a strange little twist on where things have, have been for me for so long is that I'm always preparing for the next thing. Let's just let's just kind of give this a quick answer, I suppose. Um, I own my own studio here in L.A. That came about because somewhere along the line, I found myself creating and it was very drum oriented. And the other places, the other studios, it was very difficult to go in and set up a kit or, or anything that I needed to do and just take the time necessary to create different pieces of music. Um, so the idea of my wife and I just sat down and said, OK, let's change, turn the garage into a studio so that you can have all the time you need. Um, and that's ultimately what I do now. Uh, the answer to your original question is that I create music day in and day out. I work with uh, players, uh, guys that are just tremendously famous, much more famous than I'll ever be. Uh, World class players that I can't figure out why I, why they work with me when I ask them to. Um, and these guys, these guys uh, and I will sit down and we'll create pieces of music that are full-blown pieces, not little snippets of music. And uh, and we supply music to uh, nearly every television network that there is. I, I don't think there's a network even on cable that we haven't had something on. Uh, so I'm, I'm the chief composer. I am the producer. I am the drummer. Occasionally I'm the keyboard player. I'm occasionally the singer. Uh, so that's that's ultimately what I do. And my day, my day to day is based around what I need to be doing to finish or to move forward or advance the piece of music that I happen to be working on at the time. OK, so so this is it. You create <laughs> is it like theme music, bumper music or all of the above? I, like, I'm just really curious because you described something, but we don't like have a description of the end product. Like where, where would uh, okay, people yeah. have heard you? Right. That Like the, perhaps that's a good question to, to ask. Absolutely. Well, th this past year alone, um, music that I created was used by the Los Angeles Dodgers for their in stadium music. So anybody that went to the stadium, uh, the opening, the opening song that's on the big screen with the team being introduced and, and Vince Scully doing the voiceovers, the music that's playing during that moment. That's, that's me. In fact, that's more me than most things. Wow. That, that was in my studio here where I'm sitting and I created this piece of music. It then got played there in the stadium. It got played at, at every TV commercial that the Dodgers did. So any any Dodgers game, if somebody was watching that, the music, the bumper music, as you called it, going to and from commercial, anytime they were showing the score, the Dodgers, boom, 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 those big drums, that's me. Uh, in fact, that boom, 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 boom is now my drums that they use Play. They said they came in and sampled my me playing that. So literally, when they hit the cue for it inside the stadium, that's you're hearing you. me play. That's crazy, huh? So, so that's just one thing that I did last year. That's very cool. Okay, I, yeah, and uh, yeah. you know, and I, go ahead, go ahead. No, this is this is fascinating, right? Because there's so many different ways to make a living as a musician. So I'm I'm curious, like, how did you carve this particular path? I mean. I, like, w w how did this all come about for you? Well, let's back up a bit and, okay. and, and tell you a little bit about the history. And, and I can kind of walk you forward to it, if that's cool. Sure. I'm a marching band geek, pure and simple. I, I'm I'm absolutely one of those guys that spent every waking moment in the band hall of my high school. Uh, I was playing snare drum, marching snare, marching snare, marching snare. It's all I cared about. I didn't care about girls. I didn't care about beer. I didn't care about anything. All I wanted to do was play snare drum. You just you just described high school for me, man. Yep. <laughs> See, it was just it was just everything for me, and I, I would spend hour upon hour doing this, only to find out that I was really kind of just an okay snare drummer, which kind of bummed me out. <laughs> Uh, anytime I'd go to a to a, a competition or something, I was always like second band first chair, but never first band first chair. You know, I was not that guy. Uh, then I went to a small college uh, in my in my native Mississippi, and uh, that college I met somebody that was ten years older than he should have been in college. It turned out that he had been a drum corps guy, and he saw something in me, and he said, "Okay, you're doing this wrong," and he showed me how to play traditional grip. Additional grip with my left hand, 
drumming world opened up to me. And I went from being a fairly mediocre snare drummer to being pretty good. Um, then I moved on to the University of Alabama and my first year there became first chair there. And the second year there, they asked me to join the staff. So I ended up teaching the drum line at the University of Alabama as an undergraduate years. That once I graduated from school, and by the way, I don't have a music degree. Okay. I have a sociology degree. Go, go figure. I have a sociology degree. Yeah. Hey, you know, you got to deal with people, right? So. <laughs> Why people do the things they do. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was kind of the idea. Um, so from there, I moved to Athens, Georgia, and from there to Nashville. And Nashville is where I thought, you know, okay, this is easy. I'm from Mississippi. I can. And in fact, after some time, they did. Um, I, I got some touring things happening and did a few fun things with, with some fairly sizable country stars. And uh, I got fired from a gig in which I was the musical director. And my wife says, well, you're working in L.A. a lot. Why don't we just move out there? At least six weeks later, we were here in wow. L.A. Yeah, it was just, OK, let's go. And here we go. And we started all over again. So the, the, the story continues by saying I had some endorsement deals, one of which was with Zildjian Symbols. I'm still with them. And I met the West Coast rep who, and Kirsten, if you hear this, um, she, she will laugh at this because she knows it's true. She hated me. <laughs> hey, that's all right. You know, you made an impression, right? So that's usually the most important thing. The second most important thing I, I is a good was, impression. But, uh, yeah. I know, right? I think she just, I was just yet another person she had to deal with. <laughs> so, because I'd come from the East Coast guys and, you know, they called and said, hey, buddy's moving to LA and blah, blah, blah. Well, I sat down with her and finally, after telling a few stories and, and just spending a little time together, we started having some laughs. And now she's one of my very best friends. Uh, we, You know, it's it's totally a, a complete 180. Um, so in the course of these these early conversations, I said to her, what do I need to do here in LA to make my way? And her, her comment, uh, it, it landed with me in an odd way. She said, don't worry about getting a gig. Focus instead on building your career. Ooh. Pause that you just had is the same pause that I had at the time. Uh, it took me a second. Me a, a year to figure out exactly what the difference in the two was, because the career means getting a gig, right? Well, a career means getting the next gig without having to worry about paving the path anew every time. Yeah. And so when she said that to me and it started to resonate, I realized that I needed to expand my knowledge base. So uh, I was a drummer. Yes. Drummer first and foremost, then drummer first and foremost now. But I found myself producing and, and my, my friends and family and wife, they've always said to me that I've got a producer's ear. And, and I guess there's some truth to that. And I found myself really intrigued by it. I, I was always sitting in the control room. If I was doing a session, I'd come in and sit and listen and watch people do what they do and understand how Pro Tools works and how does this. I, I, I was really fascinated by it. Yeah. So one day I was playing a gig, a rock gig, uh, with this just a, a local L.A. band, a good one, I might add, but they were, a, they were a local band. And we were playing at the Viper Room. We did our CD release like, like you used to do back in 2005. Uh, 2006, we had our CD release party at the Viper Room, and it was a show. I couldn't believe how many people were there. Well, I'm playing, and I've got my traditional grip on the drum kit, and that's the thing people talk to me most about. How do you do that? How do you hit so hard? How do you play left hand around the kit like that? And uh, this guy walks up to me after the show and, and, in fact, asked me those very same questions. And my answer to him was, I'm a band geek, and here we go, right? So he said, well, I need some drumline-styled music. Do you think you and your band might be interested in doing that? I'm like, well, who are you, right? So he hands me his business card, and he's a music coordinating producer for Fox Sports. Oh, huh. And he just he just happened to be at the Viper Room show. Wow. So, so traditional he, grip again opened the door for you. It actually this, did. It really did. Yeah, this is the key, right? Like, that's great. Huh. It is. It, it, yeah. And so this guy, uh, he uh, he invited the band. The band didn't want to go. And I said, well, OK, I'm going to go. Yeah. And, and I went and he, he hired me to do a couple of songs and two turned into five, turned into 10, turned into, turned into, turned into. Yep. You started and building a career. Fox, yeah. And there's the career that's gotten built. Yeah. And it's funny because I get hired now to do producing gigs as well um, where I'm not playing drums. And I wouldn't take the first 
10 of those that came my way because I didn't consider myself a music producer. And uh, honestly, this wife of mine, uh, who's pretty amazing, uh, I I have a great wife. Um, She looked at me and she said, how many songs have you had placed on television? And at that time I was, it was something like 75,000. You've had, you've had your songs placed 75,000 times. Yeah. And who played drums on those? Well, I did. Well, who produced those? Well, I did. Well, I think it's okay for you to call yourself a music producer. producer. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, buddy, I have a really interesting question about this. So, you know, we all know that kind of type A-ish guy who, who's a musician who's trying to build a career, who's always selling, who's always scheming. You know, you definitely don't seem like that type of thing. So, I, and especially, you know, in... You know, in L.A., right, you know, very competitive, I'm sure. And, you know, so if you could just reflect a little bit on like you got one good break that you clearly leveraged, you know, how do you kind of evaluate this whole kind of professional musician in a major scene, competitive aspects? Like, you know, do you have to constantly give yourself, uh, you know, that that be who you are pep talk and, you know, don't let the dark side lure you over, you know, to be that other guy? But you probably know those other guys, right? And so, just uh, yeah. how do you swim in a how do you swim in a pond like that? That's an interesting analogy. Swimming in a pond, I always liken it to swimming with the sharks in the ocean. Uh, in fact, that's what I say to my to my family back. I mean, listen, I'm I'm from the deep south, right? And moving here, I might as well have moved to Babylon. <laughs> uh-huh. um, they they just you know they can't get their mind around it a lot of times until they come out here and they love it. Um, I, the fact of the matter is, those guys that you're talking about. I can't stand to be around them. And so I will dismiss those guys in a heartbeat. I know exactly who they are. I see them coming from a mile away. They're Mm. at every NAM show and they're selling something new at every NAM show. And and it's like, you know, guys, just just back up. Uh, That's not at all who I am interested in being. But it sounds like your message is that you don't have to be that guy in order to make your way. Exactly right. In fact, I surround myself with great people. For instance, or the, 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 some of the guys that play with me are, are heavyweights. Mick Mahan, who plays bass for Pat Benatar and has since, I don't know, 1985 or something. Uh, and Dave Amato, who's the lead guitarist oh. in REO Speedwagon. Yeah. Uh, the three of us are a power trio, and we do this thing together quite often. Um, and those are really, this, these guys are, are rooted in the earth in every way. I mean, we'll go sit down and you know have a Reuben sandwich somewhere and talk about everything but music. And nobody's trying to outdo each other because everybody's completely comfortable with where they are in their life and in their career. And that's what I've found is the guys that are that are settled with who they are are the ones that I want to be around. And those guys that are selling, 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 and eventually. And everybody sees them for who they are. There, there's one drummer in particular, uh, and obviously I'm not going to name names, but but he he bounces from gear to gear to gear to gear, endorsement to endorsement to endorsement endorsement, and and I can't say that I've never changed endorsements. I certainly have. Sometimes they you know relationships sour or whatever, but the truth of the matter is this guy is only about getting free gear, mm. and he'll get the gear, he'll use it for a year, and then he'll sell it. That is completely wrong. That's not cool. Play what you believe in. Right. It's just not cool at all. Yeah. And yeah, now, well, of course, I mean, it flies in the face of what an endorsement should be, right? I mean, it's I, not just playing gear for the sake of playing it. It's you, like, you know, when I see somebody playing gear, it's like you've chosen that gear. Sure, there's a relationship and there's there's a, a benefit, like there's a quid pro quo for it. Fine. But I assume, and maybe, you know, you, you look at somebody and you can tell right away, like, oh, yeah. Like, there's no heart in that. I'm not going to worry about it. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. We had Dan East on the show back in the early days. We were talking about getting endorsements. And he said, well, you start with sending a note to people whose gear you really like and saying, I love your gear. I want to, you know, I want to tell people about your gear. That's the that's the basis. That's the premise of how an endorsement deal should happen is either they approach you and, you know, you check out their stuff and you really like it or you already use it and you want to tell people about it. It's, it's, you know, win-win is where the endorsement magic kind of happens. Do you agree with that? agree with that. Uh, there's, there have been one or two instances where I've been approached by, by a company and, you know, hey, check this out, check this out. And I don't dig it. And then I'll find myself on their website because they gave me something. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not endorsing this. And that's, that's one of the mistakes that in particular young guys make is that endorse you. You endorse the company. Yeah. 
name onto something means that you are saying, this is the stuff that I use because I believe in it. This is the stuff that I use because it's the best in my, in my ears or in my opinion. Um, and that's a big difference from someone saying the company endorses me. Get that mixed up because they, they're confusing endorsement with sponsorship. Right. And you'll hear that. How do I get a sponsorship? Well, I don't have a single sponsorship, but I've got 10 endorsement deals. Right. A yeah. different ball game. It goes different, two I, different I, directions. That's right. Yeah. And that's where guys get mixed up these days. And again, especially the young guys, man, I got this endorsement deal with this blah, 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 symbol company. Well, no, you really don't. They're selling you stuff at a discount. So what they did was created a customer out of you. Yeah. That's an artist deal. Yeah. They gave you a discount. That's all. Yep. Right. That's not an endorsement deal. That's 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 an artist deal. Right. Right. You know, here, have this and, and pay us 30 percent of what everybody else will or whatever. And and for me, uh, you know, I learned early on uh, the very first endorsement deal I got was with Aquarian Drumheads. And it was because Roy Burns, the the marvelous Roy Burns, me and he he offered me a deal. And I had never played an Aquarian Drumhead in my life. They make, they make, there's, there's some Aquarian drum heads that are unmatched, man. Like they have a tone to them without even being on a drum. I, I they, they do. They make some good stuff. They yeah, do. they do. Yep. Yep. It's pretty impressive. And, and, and you know, I was, I'm forever grateful to Roy for taking that chance with me. I'm not with Aquarian now. I've been with Remo for seven or eight years and I'm very, very happy with Remo. Um, but the Aquarian thing meant a lot to me because someone took a chance on me. Yeah. Right. Right. Return. Right. I was like, okay. So this is how this works. So now I've got to find out what I like about this. And subsequently, every piece of gear that I play, I now know it inside out, backwards, sideways. As because you should. I want to be able to talk about it. As yeah, you should. Right. Sure. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. So when hey, somebody buddy, here's asks, a really interesting question for you. So um, your your um, rudiment chops, your marching band chops are part of your success story. And I just want to get your opinion and thoughts on um, how certain genres of music uh, are might potentially be living on in alternative avenues. So, you know, marching band understanding, you know, classic rock, you play with a couple of great classic rock players. You know, there's not a lot of marching band music happening, you know, for the public now. And, and you know, questionably, where is, where is the genre of, you know, power trio rock and that type of thing. I'm kind of extracting from what you're saying is that, you know, those styles of music are actually being adapted commercially for things like television and, you know, stadiums and that type of stuff. Uh, so for people who want to be working musicians who kind of have that background, you know, those are the genres that they love amongst any other genres. Do you perceive that these things live on? I mean, specifically my questions would be more about kind of classic rock sounds and tones and songs. Is there, is the world still alive in alternate ways besides record releases for those types of chops? Sure. I, I, I'm going to answer your question in two parts. Um, to, to start with the classic rock sounds, let's start with that one. Um, that's modern day country music. <laughs> totally is. No, absolutely. That, I the, agree with that. Yeah. Is so, so if you're looking for that sort of vibe and that sort of sound, that's what it is. You go flip on Nashville stations and there you go. Yeah. With the vocal. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> not even yeah. a lot of that. No, that's right. Well, and, uh, yeah, tighter harmonies, maybe, but but otherwise, maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you're talking about the Eagles, I mean, the Eagles was, would be a country band today. I was just going to. I've always said that that the Eagles are a country, a new country band. They just were ahead of their time, so they got called classic exactly rock. Exactly right. Yeah, they got really and lucky to be called the... classic rock too. Like like they were one of the uh, first did. ten classic rock bands. Those guys made more money when they quit than they did when they were playing. <laughs> It's the truth, man. Wow. God. <laughs> so yep. there, there it is. You know, I mean, if you're looking for it, there it is. And I, I go to concerts. I went to a concert a couple of nights ago. Uh, some friends of mine uh, play in a band called Brit Floyd. They're a gigantic Pink Floyd cover band. Places like the Royal Albert Hall and Red Rocks. And they played the Greek theater here. So th when I say cover band, I'm, it's it's sort of a doing. Um and I looked at the, I kept looking at the audience. The Greek theater was sold out. Wow. It was all, oh, 35 and up, but really more like 45 and up uh, in age. But the people were rabid for it. I couldn't get over it. Yep. Yeah, and they actually use the same lighting and sound that Pink Floyd does. It's yeah. actually the only sanctioned Pink Floyd cover band in the world. Oh, no kidding. 
It, it makes sense, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. people grew up with this music and even though the bands have essentially stopped playing, y- you know, the, the, the desire for it is still very much there. And now all the, the people and, you know, I'm among them, right. That grew up listening to this music have a little bit of money. And so it makes sense that somebody should tap That's that it. market. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. You've, you've hit on something here and I, I want to come back to what Paul had asked a second ago, but I, but I want to hit this real quick because the, the money factor, right? One of the things that I see the music industry doing that's killing itself is that it continues to market to 12-year-old girls. Stop that, would you? <laughs> girls don't have any any musical acumen. They don't have any money. They don't understand that downloading is not going to help anyone with, that wants to have a music career in the future. So even if that 12-year-old girl decides that she wants to be a, a, a guitar player, it's not going to help her to have free downloads happening all over the world. Uh, they, they just don't understand the marketing people in the music industry marketing to the wrong group of people. Marketing people that have money, would you? Yeah, find the people that have money. Go sell there. It's a much easier huh. job. Yeah. And, and if you can find something they want, hey, you know what? You're going to get some money out of that. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. They say that people stop listening to new music at age 32. I wonder if that's because of the fact that the music changes and it gets marketed to younger and younger and younger and younger people. Uh, so there's no more relation there yeah. for people as they get into their 30s and 40s and, and so on. Yeah. Well, what about the other side? What about the musician side? So are you finding younger drummers coming up who can handle classic rock grooves? They didn't grow up with it. It's not innate in them. Um, are you finding that good musicians are good musicians and trained musicians are trained musicians? Are you finding the feel and the, the basic environment that younger musicians, younger drummers in particular grow up with affects, you know, what the next generation of musicians is going to be playing? It informs uh, uh, anything that they've heard before informs where they are and where they're going. But I hear guys playing now. I can't even wrap my mind around how good they are. Mm. They're just so good. They'll they'll approach the instrument in a way that never would have occurred to me. That's the thing they that just always blows me away is exactly that same thing. They just like how do you, I can't even think that way about this instrument. Like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But and then the, the, oh, there, there, I mean, I get tired of hearing or seeing every single five-year-old prodigy on the internet. You know, we were also <laughs> five-year-old prodigies, but the difference was that we didn't have YouTube when we were five years old. That's um, correct. You know, we could all do that stuff too. So, so please, please, I love you all. Please stop sending me videos of every three-year-old that you see playing. <laughs> uh, if I've, if, if you've seen it once, I've seen it 50 times. Um, because somebody has sent it to me every day. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> if, we do get a, if we do get a cat video of a cat playing drums, you'd want to see that, right? 50 times, please. <laughs> 50, at, le- <laughs> at least. Yeah. But, you know, well, to, to your question, Paul, kids like m- classic rock is is pretty popular, at least amongst the, the kids that I encounter and coach and that sort of thing. Like the, the rock in particular. What's that? Say that again. They love 80s. They love 80s rock in particular. Interesting. See here, it's more like seventies rock, the less so of the eighties stuff in terms of the musicians I'm talking about the kids in general. Yes. The eighties rock is popular, but the musicians are playing that seventies stuff, which is just fascinating to me. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's about, about how the marching thing has infiltrated other, other genres and whatnot. Um, that's that's actually something that I found interesting is when I began doing this was 2007. That's when I did my first work for Fox Sports and there was nobody else doing it. So I found this niche. Um, I'm never I'm never quite sure if it's niche or niche. niche. It's either um, one. I found this. I found this spot where I could live and uh, and create these drumline pieces with guitar over them or keyboard over them or whatever. And suddenly became my calling card for television. Oh, you need a drum thing? Well, this is kind of cool. Check it out. What do you think? And as that began to expand, what's happened is other people have jumped onto that. And now there's virtual drumline, which is a programming, uh, so, some software where you can program drumline sounds into music. And someone like Beyonce did an album in which several of her songs used virtual drumline uh, as the drum grooves infiltrate all sorts of different things so for instance if you're watching 
uh, if you're watching television, or let's say you're watching a football game, um, and and they go to commercial, there was a time when about 90% of the time, if you were hearing drumline stuff, you were hearing me. Wow. 50 to 60% of the time now. Um, That's so still pretty good, off. man. <laughs> Good. It is. I, I can't deny that it's it's still pretty good, and that's just my own guess on that. You know, I don't sure. have any statistics to back that up. But sure. but I I just anecdotally when I listen, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's mine. Oh, that, and sometimes I'm like, wait, I know, what, yeah, oh, that is me. That happens yeah. to me a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but the the whole idea of it, Glee, the the TV show Glee, they had some guy doing drumline stuff for every single break in that show, and I don't know who it was, and I wish I'd gotten that gig. But he did a great job of it, and that, I think, is what launched pushing the drumline thing more into the public consciousness. And so now you might hear drumline um, in a car commercial. In fact, I've done a couple. You might hear drumline in, in a, a, I don't know, a pharmaceutical commercial. You just have no idea where drumline is going to show up now in ways that it never would have 10 years ago. Huh. I sent it to you, and you've asked the question more. Uh oh, you cut out there, buddy. We're getting a little, a little bit of skypiness or whatever it is. Say, say that again. Uh, uh, um, now that I've mentioned to you uh, what uh, about how how common this has become. Yeah, we'll notice hear it. it and recognize it more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. Pretty cool, man. This is very yeah. such cool oh, man. So cool, so cool. Uh, Paul, you got I, I, go I, you know I. I wanted to be a rock star, of course. I mean, that's why we all get into this, right? I want to be right. a rock star. Right. And, in, and instead, I've just built this steady career. There's, You know, I've played some giant gigs in my life. I've played some some big tours in my life. But this is really what I do. And so, you know, literally day in and day out, I'm working with some of the best musicians in the world. Create music on my own terms all the time. And you don't have to spend your life on a bus and in hotel rooms either. I mean, I know you're going to do no. these clinics and I, I want to ask a little bit about that, but, but like generally speaking, like you get to wake up in your own, in your own house every day. And that yeah. for anybody that spent any amount of time on the road, that, that is worth its weight in gold right there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So my last question, buddy, is what can you share about the difference between the Nashville scene and the LA scene? What, what, why did you move? I mean, you could have done a home studio in either place. There's more TV and, and, and film out in LA, I would guess, but what are the like subtle differences in the, in the music cultures, in the musician cultures? Like, is it a better bro scene in Nashville, more supportive, or is it the same kind of like, you know, a bunch of people trying to find their way and it's very intense and very competitive. Okay. So Treading lightly here. <laughs> um, uh, Nashville is interested in musicians and more interested in singer songwriters. Okay. I was pretty purely a drummer at that point. Packing order and drums were at the very bottom of it. Mm, right. So a lot of what they want there, at least in my, and this is my own experience. Okay. So, uh, so uh, you know, your, your, your usage may vary. Um, I found that they weren't interested in creativity from drummers when they found out I was a singing drummer. Oh no, no, no. We don't want you singing. No, no, no. Huh. Um, it, it was strange. I was there for eight years nearly. And at that time, what I discovered was that, Nashville wants you to recreate what's on the record, and the same five guys create every record. Guys are playing from a, a, a lexicon of licks, and they're going to play, okay, let's put lick 2A in this spot and lick 17C in that spot. Well, your, your job as the player later is to recreate that, not to build something not to be creative the creativity is in the is in the songwriting in particular right. and there are some world class songwriters there for sure um and i loved the city of nashville i loved it people were fun i had a really wonderful time while i was there um but the music industry is a machine and a machine that continues to churn out and particularly appeal to me even as a as a kid growing up in Mississippi and Alabama, I didn't love country music. Um, so for me, it do, it just didn't resonate with who I was or who I am. 
Uh, and perhaps that was just my own small rebellion against growing up in Mississippi and Alabama. I don't know. Um, sure, that's fair. Yeah. And, and so I found myself when I moved to Nashville, I was trying to do all of the non-country music things. And and in fact, I did get some of those gigs. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the the fusion guitarist Stan Lasseter. Oh yeah. I worked with Stan for a year and a half, and I once I got that gig, I got a little pigeonholed. Oh, buddy's that guy that plays a lot of notes with Stan with that you know i'm okay with being labeled a fusion guy or a funk guy i was fine with that the problem was that in nashville that's not what they were looking for from me anyway right uh, and so so this is pretty broad strokes that i'm painting with and you ask for subtlety um but uh the, the broad stroke of it is that it was not the right fit for me and so when i'm when i moved to la here's what i discovered la has the very best players in the world vinnie kaliuta the very best drummer on the, on the planet he lives here, but then you've got guys that call themselves professionals that really just have a drum set in a garage who have no business con- calling themselves professionals. So you get this, get this wide range of players. Nashville has no Vinnies, but no garage guys either. It's kind of a level five, maybe like a level six to level eight in yeah. Nashville. So everybody's good. Nobody's particularly great, but everybody's really freaking good. That's how it you was know? in Austin, yeah. too. That like you didn't. There I you mean, go. occasionally you would encounter somebody terrible, sure, but by and large, everybody was just like really good. But that was it. It, it was it was very sort of normalizing, if you will. If there was somebody who was very great, good. they didn't stand out. That's for sure. Yeah, a really good way to to look at how I view the Nashville thing, and 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 I have. I mean, my friend Dorico Watson uh, plays for Victor Wooten's band, and Dorico is one of the best drummers on the planet, and he lives in Nashville. So make no mistake, you know the, yeah. these these. They got some great players there, but the level is different. It's not the same as what they have here. The, the, it's just a different level. I mean, with Vinny and Weckl living here, uh, that pretty well sums up everything you need to know about L.A. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, these these are the guys that you run into when you go to the Trader Joe's. It's just insane. Yeah. Uh, so what <laughs> I found, Paul, is that that L.A. is actually a little more supportive than Nashville. Nashville is, uh, I use the old crabs in a boiling pot analogy. Do you guys know that one? Yeah, of course. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, well, well, if you put a bunch of crabs in a pot and turn the heat on, they're going to stay in there and bathe and boil themselves to death. And what happens is some of the crabs kind of realize what's happening and they start trying to crawl out. Got it. But Got it. The, other, the other crabs reach up and pull them back down in. Yep. Makes sense. Until they all die. And so that's the same, that's kind of what happens there is uh, when I left Nashville in 2004, Local gigs were paying fifty dollars a gig, and from what I understand, they're still paying fifty dollars a gig because everybody's willing to do it for forty five dollars a gig. Yep, that's Austin. You know, there's some there there's some, <laughs> there's some new there's some new kid that comes into town and oh man, I'll do it for free. Yeah, I mean, wages low for we, everybody. We have that very conversation almost weekly on the show, all the time on this show. <laughs> there yep. you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really. Did really had anything new to that? I didn't. I, yeah, no. it's the same conversation, just, right? Just shame, just shame on them is, is basically it. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of it, you know. And I get it when you're young and you're trying to figure out who you are and how to improve yourself. I get it. You, that's what you feel like you need to do, but you're really screwing yourself down the road. Yeah, and not do that, that far down the road. Like maybe even just into next week. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I know a, a massive country star who pays her bands, her band three hundred dollars a piece per show. Wow. I won't leave my living room for that, you know? Wow. <laughs> and so she's she's a major, major star, and she pays them 300 bucks a show. Oh. Well, here's the obvious question for that. Those guys who take that gig at that money, do they typically mm-hmm. get the leverage that they need by taking that gig and then go on to better stuff and better pay with someone else because now they have that on their resume? I mean, is, is there at least that angle to leverage off of? that um particularly in fact what i have seen is that guys end up taking it end up having very little career wow Wow. the lifespan of it and that's what my friend kirsten from zildjian was saying got to build future and i've had a time not worked another day job professional musician for 18 years that's awesome man eight in in 18 years, in 18 years, I've seen the biggest star come and go. 
Yeah. And yet here I am. I just keep plugging along and keep making. Yeah. I, I make a pretty good living, and and we live in a really nice spot of of LA and and all of that. And it's it's really different when you stop looking at it as get the next gig. And I, and I totally understand what Kirsten meant when she said that now. Well, and that like that's I really have an eighteen year career. Yeah. That's that's really good advice for people too. Is is I mean, in music or really any career, is figure out what you do and then just do that and do it really and well. Do it well, yeah, and do it with good people and and you know don't let the short game tempt you because it's the short game for a reason, right? So well said. Yeah, fascinating. It's been an interesting thing to me. You know, I mean, I've played. I need little clubs. Somebody actually asked me, uh, I don't know, a week or so ago, what the my favorite gig I ever played was. And I'm sure they were expecting me to say one of the ones where I was playing in front of 100,000 people or whatever. Uh, the answer is a little coffee shop in Nashville, of all things. Huh. Um, gig, it was a, a jazz gig with one of my favorite uh, musicians in Nashville, Tony Marvelli. Uh, he's one of the best bass players on planet Earth. And tell me we did a jazz thing at some coffee house. And it was like we were floating above the stage watching ourselves because we were just in that zone. That's awesome. To this day, my favorite gig that I've ever played. There might have been cool five people at that show. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not much no. beyond a rehearsal. That's right. Yeah. And I, and I just don't even care. It was just such an amazing thing. Yeah. That's what you keep chasing, you though. Know, I, That's I the problem, it. right? Is it? it is. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, yeah, it's, it's been a fun career and uh, not the direction I expected or the path I expected to be going down, but I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And the stable career, a stable life, but more stability than most musicians, I suppose. Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, the fact that you don't have to go and and not that there's anything wrong with taking the, you know, the touring gigs here and there, but but you don't even I mean, at least at this point and thus far along the way. Like you haven't had to consider that you get to, you know, you get to like do what you want to do and stay at home and you get to see your wife. And like, that's a great thing. Well, when I go on a tour now, it's because I'm choosing to go on that tour. Right. It's, it's a fun thing or, or, you know, Hey, that sounds like fun. That's how long is it? Three weeks. Yeah, let's do it. You know? Yeah. Right. That, that's when I'll do a tour now. And instead of trying to, to I'm not gonna be able to eat in two weeks if I don't take the tour, if you don't take that, the that's tour, not where yeah, I am. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and like the this clinic thing that that you asked about the um, uh, maybe I should let you ask about the clinic before I start talking about no, it. No, it's totally fine. I I, I it, you know I know that you do uh, drum clinics. You, you head back to to you know Mississippi, right? And or at least that's where the next one is. But, yeah. but you do you kind of do them all the over. Couple are, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is this is airing Monday the ninth, right? Correct. So Tuesday the tenth is is a is a drum camp clinic camp slash clinic at Copiah Lincoln Community College in Wesson, Mississippi. Um, it's going to be three days of marching fundamentals, meaning moving your body on the field, um, marching drumming fundamentals, playing snare drum, etc., and then drum kit as well. And the way that they use drum kit within marching now is quite different than what we did when I was playing in marching bands. So, so this three day thing, the 10th, 11th and 12th at Compile Lincoln. And, and just in case somebody's listening, there are still some slots available if you'd like to come. Um, it's 40 bucks for three days. So, you know, not, not bad. Dude. Uh, I don't charge for this, by the way, I, when I do these things stuff, because the clinics are my way of giving back to that area. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's awesome. man. Losing my voice. Um, and then, uh, then two weeks later on July 21st, I'm doing a, a normal one to two hour clinic at Brookhaven Music Store in Brookhaven, Mississippi. That's seven o'clock, July 21st. Um, and that's free of charge. No, no admission there. So come on wow. out. Um, and then later this year, I think it's OK for me to talk about this. Um, l- let me put it this way. The biggest music store chain in the country doesn't have drum in their name but has another instrument in their name. Um, they are, they are, we're doing a series of clinics um, uh, that's going to be titled from field to film. So it's going to be about the career building and how to, how I've crafted my career and doing the clinic where I'm teaching guys exactly that sort of thing. So we're going to start here in Hollywood and do, do the Hollywood store. And then I think retro Cucamonga and then San Diego 
to start and later on in the year i'm going to go east to the drummers collective and uh the sam ash stores i can say that one i'm going to be doing sam ash stores on the northeast in the northeast later this year as well at least that's how things are looking very cool man that's awesome Wow, that's great. Well, when you get out, when you're coming out to the Northeast, when you know your dates, let me know, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll, I'll I, close enough I can make it to one of them. That'd be great. Oh, that'd be great! Fantastic! Absolutely! Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Well, thanks, man. This has been, I mean, so what a great perspective, a great, you know, you you really have carved out, uh, you know, it's it seems like a unique career, but I don't think I don't think it's that unique, right? I mean, I think other people are doing similar things just leveraging their strengths and interests and, and just, you know, doing what you do. I think it's awesome. Which is, which I, is great. I definitely, I find like when I go to the NAMM show and, and I'm doing autograph sessions or whatever, people don't quite know if I should be on the drum autograph tables or if I should be at the producer autograph tables <laughs> or, or what. So, so even the interest industry doesn't quite know where to place me. Yeah. That's Sometimes. good. That's success <laughs> right fundamentally, there. Fundamentally. Yeah. So, I mean, fundamentally, I'm a drummer. I like to hit things and make noise. I, 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 you know, I mean, that's fundamentally who I am. So I, I still I identify as drummer first, producer second, composer third. Um, and, and I do it in that order because that's what I feel like my skill level is. My skill level on drums is number one. My skill level as a producer is number two. And my skill level as a composer is number 47. <laughs> hey, you know. Well, clearly the world is sending you uh, a little bit of information that uh, that you might want to raise that number 47 a little bit because you're clearly you're, <laughs> yeah. you're making your way through it, which is a very inspiring story. And, and buddy, thanks for your frankness and your honesty. I think a lot of things you shared here are going to be really helpful to people who listen to this show. So tell people where pleasure. they can Absolutely. tell people where they can find you before we say goodbye here. BuddyGibbons.com is my website address. And I am, of course, on Facebook. It's Facebook.com slash BuddyGibbons. And I'm on Instagram at BudDrums. That's got two Ds, BudDrums. Uh, and Twitter, I'm BuddyGDrums because somebody had Bud Drums and wouldn't give it up. <laughs> of course. Thanks for that. <laughs> Of course. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Bud Drums on everything else, even my email. So, uh, I mean, yeah, here I'm about to start getting emails. Um, but, uh, but I've got Bud Drums on everything in the world except Twitter. <laughs> well, you know, that's how it goes, right? That's the, 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 yeah. the wild west of social media. So there you have it. It is, it is. But I'm a Facebook, Instagram guy, and, uh, and uh, I tend to do a lot more on those two uh, platforms than the others. So come by, say hello. Cool. Friend well, request me. I like I like meeting people, including Dave. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Look, if he's friends with me, yeah. he's friends with everybody. That's fine. You know, he, he, he'll go, te- he'll tolerate anyone if he'll tolerate me. So there you go. I have no idea how difficult it is. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine how Paul deals with it week in and week out. There you go. Hey, I keep coming back, Paul, right? I, do. I know. It's yeah, fun. You do live in, in wine country, so I'm assuming there's you know a reason for that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Uh, that's it. Thanks everybody for listening, buddy. Thanks again so much for coming on the show and, and doing this with us. This has been a blast. Thanks everybody. Find us giggabpodcast.com buddy at buddygibbons.com. We'll see you next time. We're taking next week off folks. So savor this and then we'll be back. What's it that we like to say, Paul? You got any advice? Just for like buddy? buddy. Just be like buddy. Always be performing. <laughs>